Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Husky-voiced Dusty Springfield was known as the White Queen of Soul. Hailed as Britain's best ever pop singer by Rolling Stone, the English-born Dusty Springfield charted several 1960s hits, including Son of a Preacher Man. After a bout with drugs and alcohol, she saw her career resurrected. How Dusty Springfield's lifelong difficulties were catching up with her. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. In the 1960s, Britain was a world of psychedelia, mods, rockers, thigh-grazing miniskirts, street protest and sexual liberation. London in particular had thrown off the gloom of post-Second World War austerity and was ready to embrace a new beginning filled with colour, optimism and culture. And if anyone was ready to unravel societal norms, it was British music legend and emergent queer icon Dusty Springfield. But for a long time, Springfield had to wait for the world to catch up to her. Dusty Springfield was one of the finest singers to emerge from the froth and bubble of the swinging 60s. In many ways, she epitomised the sound and style of the era. Yet her unique voice, powerful, sensual and rich in passion, had a timeless quality that has proved appealing to new generations of fans. Springfield was determined to elevate the craft of pop singing by careful choice of material. Her affinity for soul music enabled her to imbue her own singing with its values, without resorting to mere shouting and screaming. She admired the great American performers like Aretha Franklin and Gladys Knight, and was selflessly keen to promote their work. However, Dusty Springfield, more than the other girls who put their stamp on the 60s, had a unique power and maturity. Even now, you only have to mention songs like I Only Want To Be With You, I Just Don't Know What To Do With Myself, and You Don't Have To Say You Love Me, and it's possible to hear Dusty's voice, sometimes strident, sometimes delicate, her character imprinted on every note. Dusty Springfield was a big, big star in the 60s, with hits on both sides of the Atlantic, but she was much more than that. Dusty was an icon partly because of her sexuality, but also because she showed that a singer in the 60s, and a female singer at that, could have some control over her career. She could choose what she wanted to record and not just sing songs she was told to. The box set, The Magic of Dusty Springfield, is both perfectly titled because she did make magic and because it shows the many facets to the recording career of one of the great voices of the 20th century. She made her mark as a female hitmaker and icon during the 1960s beat boom that resulted in the British invasion. But Dusty's remarkable career, including her difficult reputation, her sexual ambivalence and the excesses of drink and drugs, and explores why she became an enduring pop icon. A British singer whose style and husky voice emulated the Motown sounds she adored, Dusty Springfield was born Mary Isabel Catherine Bernadette O'Brien on April 16, 1939, in London, England, to an Irish mother and a Scots-Irish father. Springfield was a plain, albeit tomboyish, child who earned the name Dusty playing football with the boys on the street outside the family home in Ealing. Growing up, family life was fraught. Her mother was an alcoholic with a tendency to throw food, while her abusive father repeatedly told young Springfield that she was stupid and ugly. She endured a difficult childhood which was marked by the near-constant arguing of her Irish parents, which resulted in Springfield engaging in self-harm. Aged 16, in 1955, North London convent schoolgirl Mary O'Brien believed she was dull-witted, boring and destined to be an old maid working in a library. Dusty was an unprepossessing teenager at St Anne's Convent School, with short auburn hair and thick glasses. Although she credited it with her first blues performance in a school assembly, she quickly shed the persona of Mary O'Brien after she left at 16, and shocked school friends a year later when she appeared as a glamorous and fully made-up blonde. Though Springfield's childhood had been soundtracked by fuming rows, there was also a deep appreciation of music, classical jazz and Springfield's favourite, American rhythm and blues. At a young age, Mary and her elder brother Dion began singing and making tape recordings in their parents' garage. 
She started performing at local clubs with her brother and in 1958, after answering an advert in The Stage, she joined the all-girls singing trio The Lana Sisters. Her career really came into being on a spring day in 1960 when Dusty agreed to be a founding member of the hugely successful group The Springfields with her brother Dion, who changed his name to Tom. For three years, the Springfields were one of the biggest groups in Britain and Ireland, with hits including Silver Threads and Golden Needles. Dusty, with her blonde beehive hairdos and heavy panda eye makeup, was an instantly recognisable celebrity, an icon of the black and white 60s, yet many saw this image as a mask to conceal an awkward, insecure woman who needed to be reassured. In fact, she was quite capable of defending herself, as critics and detractors soon found. When interviewed in Music Maker magazine in 1966, she was described as Britain's most powerful answer to the soul sound then sweeping the nation. Dusty is that rare bird, a singer who knows music well, a singer who has to believe in a song before recording it, a singer with soul. Her reputation in music circles can be summarised in three words. Anything won't do. In late 1963, she left the Springfields and transformed herself with a far-out wardrobe. Springfields' first solo hit, I Only Want To Be With You, was released in 1964. The same year, she was deported from South Africa for refusing to sing before a segregated audience. Springfield built herself a unique fan base that skewed older than the typical teeny pop fan. Over the next half decade, Springfield was a fixture on the pop charts. The pinnacle of her success came in 1968 with her album Dusty in Memphis, on which the singer, who'd long adored singers like Mavis Staples and Aretha Franklin, worked with legendary music producer Jerry Wexler, the man behind albums by Franklin and Ray Charles. I was deeply influenced by black singers from the early 1960s, she once said. I liked everybody at Motown and most of the Stax artists. I really wanted to be Mavis Staples. What they shared in common was a kind of strength I didn't hear on English radio. Dusty in Memphis was a tremendous success, anchored by one of Springfield's biggest hits, Son of a Preacher Man. It climbed to number 10 on the US charts. Dusty was a definitive interpreter of the great American songwriters of the day, Randy Newman, Goffin and King, Bacharach and David, and on stage and on vinyl, she amazingly mixed girl power pop with big band jazz, Italian ballads, bossa nova, and most stunningly, renditions of R&B gems. British singer Cliff Richard rather pejoratively dubbed her the White Negress, but missed the essence of her homage to that music. It was a simple homage to arguably Britain's best female singer. In the late 1960s, Springfield began to make herself seriously as a soul diva. In 1965, she hosted a television special that promoted Motown artists, including the Supremes and Martha and the Vandellas, to British audiences, and she often performed American rhythm and blues songs in her own subsequent TV appearances. As her stardom grew, so did her reputation. Springfield is remembered now as being difficult to work with, though some excuse the behaviour simply as a woman trying to make her way in a man's world. Springfield was 25 years old before she had her first sip of alcohol. It was an 88-proof sup of vodka, offered to her by a member of the Temptations during a 12-night series in New York when Springfield was complaining of a sore throat. It was Springfield's determination to extract high standards from her backing musicians and to brook no nonsense or interference from promoters and occasionally waiters in restaurants that earned her notoriety as a troublemaker when cakes and drinks went flying at pop parties and award ceremonies. It was usually dusty getting stuck into the mayhem with an enthusiasm. Springfield continued to record into the 1970s, but her career was derailed by poor management and struggles with drugs and alcohol. By the middle of the decade, she was working as a session singer in Los Angeles. Perhaps because she was denied an outlet creatively, perhaps because her lifelong fears and inadequacies were catching up with her, Dusty began seriously to abuse drugs and alcohol. Soon she found herself caught in an alcoholic haze that's still all too familiar to those torn between the closet and the need to live their own true lives. 
Still plagued with insecurities from her past, Springfield re-engaged in self-harm. She eventually surrounded herself with people who helped her stay clean, but she said, It's very easy to stop drinking, to stop doing drugs, but it's not easy to stay stopped. Springfield's life didn't allow her to play it for laughs. The result is a compelling and often poignant look at the private life of a celebrity who resisted the prying eyes of fans and media during her lifetime. The 60s were Dusty's decade, a time when, musically at least, she could do no wrong. But there was a price to be paid. Dusty's relentless quest for perfection and her refusal to compromise, together with the daily pressure of having to live out the role she had created for herself, took their toll. When her career lost its way in the 70s, she descended into drug and alcohol abuse, and she was dogged by speculation about her sexuality. In 1971, she came out publicly as a bisexual, though by most sources she was a lesbian. During the late 1960s and early 70s, Springfield was romantically linked to Norma Tanega, a California-born singer-songwriter who wrote a few of Springfield's songs, such as Go My Love. After a period of much reduced professional activity in the 1970s and early 1980s, a period when Dusty had serious issues with both drink and drugs, she came back with a bang in 1987. She recorded with the Pet Shop Boys, What Have I Done to Deserve This, made number two on the UK charts, and rekindled many people's interests in a singer who had never fallen out of affection with her fans. She followed it with the excellent Nothing's Been Proved, from the movie Scandal, about shocking goings-on in the upper echelons of British politics in the 60s, who better to sing the theme song. It is thus a tragedy that Dusty Springfield's whole existence was blighted by her orientation, which explains the silence and secrecy she extended over much of her life and her self-loathing. One glance at her chin should have revealed all, but the 60s was not a fraction as liberated and swinging as people now assume. Being homosexual was either a pitiable affliction or an actual mental illness. Victims were treated with aversion therapy and electric shocks. She was linked to many women during her life, including photojournalist Faye Harris and singer Carol Pope. In 1982, she married actress Tedda Bracci, whom she met at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Though the wedding wasn't legally recognised, they lived together for two years. When her relationship with Tanega fell apart, Springfield headed to California, lured in by the area's relaxed approach to sexuality. Later in life, Springfield became a camp icon, attracting homosexual fans and drag impersonators. In 1994, a breast cancer diagnosis took a toll on her career. Sadly, Springfield's health took a decline in the 1990s. While recording her final album in 1995, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and battled the disease for four years. But throughout it all, her musical reputation and the loyalty of her admirers remained undiminished, and in the 1980s, after a long, hard struggle to re-establish herself, she enjoyed a period of success. Dusty Springfield looks beyond the tired clichés and journalistic shorthand to offer a detailed and rounded portrait of a deeply complex woman, and provides the first major assessment of the musical career of a singer whose reputation is higher now than it ever has been. After being diagnosed with cancer in early 1994, Dusty Springfield took some treatment that helped alienate the disease for some time. However, in 1996, the disease was back again, haunting her and affected her career greatly. She died three years later, on March 2nd, 1999. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Dusty Springfield? Her legendary, haunting, soulful sound has inspired a generation of music.